Will you please stand for the reading of God's Word? I'll be reading Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all the way, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not a Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. This is God's word. You may be seated. Uh, last week we saw how the Old Testament ceremonial laws, and specifically those laws pertaining to dietary restrictions and and certain festivals, um, Paul called those things a shadow, and he suggested that Jesus is the substance. So as shadows, they were meant to teach us and point us to and ultimately lead us to the substance, which is Christ. We know that shadows are two-dimensional images. Um, They can give us a rough outline. They can show us what something looks like. They can provide us with a general idea. But shadows, in and of themselves, they have no power. They have no strength. They have uh, no substance. And so we saw that these shadows pointed to Jesus, who is the substance. And consequently, Paul was arguing that those Old Testament ceremonial laws are no longer binding for the church, that we are to not let anybody judge us based on what we eat or we do not eat. Paul says, let nobody judge you. And Paul also says, because these ceremonial laws were a shadow, he suggests that they have no power to actually change you. As a shadow, they can reveal our need to be cleansed, but those shadows, they have actually no power to change our hearts. So this kind of begs a question. If these laws, if these ceremonies were a shadow to point us towards Christ and there's a cleansing that we need, but the shadows can't actually cleanse us, then how is it that we change? Right? If they're powerless to change us, then how is it that we actually are changed? How do we change? And so we'll be considering three things that we see in this text that are crucial to personal change. They are understanding our past, understanding our present, and understanding our future. Understanding the past, the present, and the future. We'll begin by understanding our past. Everybody who has ever come to faith in Christ has a past. If you are a Christian, you have a past. That is to say there is a person that you used to be, a person you used to be that you no longer are. I was having coffee with a person this week, and they told me that if I had known them before they came to Christ, I would not have liked them which I thought, how do you know I like you now? (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) I was kidding. (laughs) I do like you, Robin. (laughs) But the reality is that that that's true of every single one of us, right? We all have a past. We all have a person that we used to be, and that person that we used to be is not pretty. In this text, Paul gives us a description of the old man. He gives us a description of the person that we used to be. He gives us an image of who we once were. Look at verses five through nine. Put to death, therefore, what is 
earthly in you. By the way, pay attention to that word earthly. It's going to come up later. This is what Paul means when he speaks of earthly things. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Paul is, is painting a picture for us. These are behaviors and attitudes and actions that characterize life outside of Christ. He mentions anger and wrath, malice, slander, and dishonesty. These are all things that happen in the context of, of community and relationship with one another. These all are, if you were to think in the tables of the law, these are like second table commandments. These are second table sins. These are sins that we commit against one another. Anger is, is what? A, a refusal to forgive people, a deep frustration that you cannot control everything all of the time. Wrath and malice are the desire to see other people suffer, to delight in the misfortune of others, to rejoice in the pain that others experience. Slander, speaking poorly of other people, often to make yourself look better. Dishonesty, telling lies, often to save yourself from consequences and or to gain the approval of other people. These are all sins that every single one of us can identify with. If, if you don't think you can identify with these things, I would suggest you do not know yourself. These things are common to the sinful heart. But it's like an infomercial. Wait, there's more. Paul keeps going, coveting. Refusing to be content with what God has provided you with and being jealous of what God has blessed your neighbor with. Being upset that your neighbor got the new cool thing and you didn't. He speaks of evil desire, and that is not simply desiring evil things. He's talking about an excessive desire for things. This is to be obsessed with something, an inordinate desire, passion, being a slave to your impulse. You want, you get. You think, you do. Whatever you desire, you submit to. And then he says it. Sexual immorality. What sexual immorality does Paul have in mind here? All sexual immorality. According to what standard? According to the scriptures. This would include things like lust, pornography, sex before marriage, which the Bible calls fornication, sex outside of marriage, adultery, any and all same-sex attraction or activity. This would include any definition of marriage that is not one man and one woman for one lifetime. This would include transgenderism, the lie that a man can become a woman or a woman can become a man. All of this and more falls into this broad category of sexual immorality. And Paul says these things are idolatry. These things are idolatry. What is the very first commandment we have in the giving of the law? The very first commandment is to have no other gods before God. And the only reason we ever break, break commandment two through 10 is because we have already broken commandment one. The reason we lie, the reason we give ourselves to sexual immorality, the reason we are greedy, we are cutty, or that we, uh, we, we desire things. All of these things are a result of idolatry, meaning there is another God that has occupied the throne of our hearts and our minds. All of it, including sexual immorality. Now, some of you may be thinking, 
that a very small segment of our community may be offended by what was just said. But if that's what you heard and that's what you think, you do not understand what Paul is saying. Paul's point is not that these are bad people and these are good people. Paul is not talking about the world. He's talking about the church. Paul is describing what individuals in the church once were. Look at verses 5 and 7. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in who? You. He says in verse 7, in these you too once walked. So, So Paul is not giving us a sinful diagnosis of the world. He's saying, church, this is who you used to be. This is a description of the way that you lived your life. This is about our past. We were liars. We were angry. We were guilty of malice. We were covetous. We were sexually immoral. We were impure. We were slaves to our passions and our appetites. But that's the good news, friends. We were. We were. Do you remember who you were before you came to Christ? Remember what your life was like, the decisions you made, the passions you had, the desires that you pursued? Do you remember who you were? I I don't know about you, but I personally find Paul's description quite accurate. Do you see yourself in that list of sins? You want to know who you were? It's right there in the text. That's who we all were. But that's not who we are anymore. And this is the really good news, is that who you were doesn't have to be who you are for the rest of your life. What characterized your life in the past does not have to characterize your life in the future. You can actually change. To this morning, you may be here and you may be desperate. You may feel like you're at the end of your rope. You may feel like there is no hope for you because you have made an utter mess of your life and you cannot imagine that things would ever be right. There is hope for you. A few dietary restrictions and some new rules to follow will not transform you. They won't do you any good. But there is hope. There is hope. This leads us to understanding our presence. In verses one through three, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The good news of the gospel is not that God likes you. The good news of the gospel is not that God has a wonderful plan for your life. The good news of the gospel is that in Christ, you can die and be raised. The wages of sin is death. We see this truth played out in our own lives and in our own culture. Whenever we abandon God's plan and his laws, our lives and our society is thrown into chaos. Sin brings chaos and ultimately it brings death. God is righteous and he is holy and he is good. And that means that he must deal with sin. It must be addressed. It must be put down. But in grace and love and kindness, God sent his son into this world. And God did not send his son into this world to be our therapist. He did not send his son into this world to be a good buddy. He sent his son into the world to suffer and die for our sins. He sent him as an atoning sacrifice. He sent him to be judged and to suffer the wrath of God in our place so that those who are in him would never face 
that wrath or that judgment. And the Bible teaches us that in some mysterious way, when Jesus died, we died with him and in him so that his death is somehow our death. When Christ died, you died. And what that means is that your old self was hung on a cross and buried in a tomb. The old you, friends, if you are in Christ, the old you is dead and it no longer lives. This is what Paul means when he says you have died in Christ. Now, you're alive, right? It's early on Sunday, but you are alive. Your heart is beating. Your mind is working, maybe at 30%, but you are alive. But you also died, and you are dead in Christ. The old you is dead. So you have died with Christ, but, but union with Jesus' death also means that we are united with his resurrection. And so just as Jesus literally rose from the dead, physically rose from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures, so too we who are in Christ have been raised to new life with him. Consequently, we have been given new life, We have been given new hearts. We have been given new thoughts. We have been given new desires because we now have Jesus' resurrection power living and at work within us. The word that Paul uses to describe this in the book of Ephesians is dynamite. There's an explosive resurrection Holy Spirit power in you. That's why you are a new person. And this, friends, is why we can change. This is why we have hope. This is why there is hope for you this morning, even if your life feels like a total and utter disaster. The old self that was characterized by sinful idolatry has been put to death. And a new self, empowered by the Spirit of God, is alive in us. And what that means is it's not our own strength and ability that changes us. It is the power of God in us, his resurrection power that changes us. And Paul says, church, you need to remind yourself of this. You need to remember who you were, who you used to be how you thought and what you desired. You need to remember that old self and remember that old self has been put to death and so now there is a new self in Christ. Don't just remember this. You need to orient your lives around this truth and reality. Do you want to change this morning? If you want to change, some some old covenant dietary restrictions won't do it. Some new rules to your life won't do it. Some new principles applied to the way you think won't do it. Eating certain foods won't do it because what goes into your mouth is not the problem. In Matthew 15, Jesus said, It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. You can quote that to every person who talks to you about carbs. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person, and it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Friends, this is the problem right here. This is your problem. This is our problem. And the only solution to that is to have that old heart put to death and to receive a new heart, a new resurrection heart. So Paul can say, you have died in Christ because the old you has been put to death, church. Stop acting like the old you. Stop acting like the old self. The old you was put to death on the cross. So put those old desires to death. And how do we do that? How do we kill those desires? Look at verses two and three. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now remember, I said earlier, those earthly things are not physical 
possessions. What Paul means by earthly things are the behaviors that are listed in verses five through nine. What is earthly? Sexual immorality is earthly. Anger is earthly. Malice is earthly. And those things. So Paul is not saying, stop thinking about your job. Stop thinking about your household. Stop thinking about your finances. Stop thinking about your car. Stop thinking about anything that's in here. And start thinking about floaty clouds and angels, fat angels with wings and harps. Think about those things. That, that's not what Paul is saying here. He's saying, don't set your minds on those old habits, on those old idols, on those old patterns. Rather, think about who Christ is, what Christ has accomplished, and who you are in him. Think about those things. Remember all that Jesus is and all that he has accomplished. Take your thoughts captive. So think about this for a moment. Consider, meditate upon the incarnation of Christ. Jesus left the glory of heaven and came to this earth. Why did he do that? What was he seeking to gain for himself? You. You. He is Emmanuel, God with what? Us, God drawn near to us. So, so think about this. God has drawn near to you. And the Son has taken upon himself our flesh and our humanity. He was made like us in every way, and yet he was without sin. Think about that. From heaven to earth for you. Think about his cross his betrayal, his suffering, and his sacrifice. The Bible says this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is the climax of God's revelation of his love for you, the cross. Do you want to know how Deeply you are loved. Meditate on the suffering of Christ. You are deeply, perfectly, completely loved. Think about his empty grave and his resurrection. Think about what that means. Think about the great power displayed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If the Father is able to raise the Son from death to new life, then the Father is able to do anything, right? If God can overcome our, our enemy, death, then God can overcome any enemy we have, correct? If he's able to do that, then certainly he must have the power to radically transform your desires. Friends, you are not a slave to what you desire. The fact that you desire something does not mean it's okay for you to pursue it. We are not slaves to our desire. God has the power to radically transform our desires. And it doesn't matter how strong or broken those desires may be. God can change the appetites of our souls. If he has power to raise Christ from the dead. Certainly he has the power to heal your wounds. Some of you, you have been hurt deeply numerous times. It's unthinkable to consider that you might be made whole. But the God who has the power to raise Jesus from the dead also has the power to heal your wounds, no matter how deep they may be. You, you have a, a conscience that is weighed down by knowledge of the things that you have done. 
You're constantly walking in condemnation. The Bible says that if you are in Christ, there is no condemnation. God, who has the power to raise his son, has the power to forgive your sins, no matter how evil they may be. Think about his ascension. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling over all things, defeating his enemies. If Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father and he is ruling over all of his enemies and he's subduing them, what enemies could possibly threaten the rule and reign of Christ? If all authority in heaven on earth has been given to him, then what threatens him? Nothing threatens him. And so if he is truly seated on the throne and ruling over all things, then certainly, friends, he can reorder the mess that is your life. If he is Lord of all, then his opinion of you is the only opinion that matters. Your identity in Christ is the most important thing about you. Who you used to be does not define you. What the world says you are does not define you. What your closest friends around you say you are does not define you. What you say of yourself does not even define you. It's about what Jesus says you are. And in him, we die and we are raised. In him, we receive a new identity and a new family. In verse 11, it says here, meaning in Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and is in all. So Paul is not saying when you become a Christian, you seek to be German or you seek to be whatever you are. He's saying when you're in Christ, those things are subservient to your identity in Christ because Christ is all. He is over all. See how liberating this is? You are not defined by your sin. You're not defined by where you came from. You're not defined by your past. You are defined by Christ in whom you have died and been raised to new life. So Paul says, look to him and think about that truth. Understand who Christ is and understand what it means for you to be buried and raised with him because that is what you are. And this is how we put to death our old, earthly, sinful nature. This leads us to understanding our future. In verse 4, it says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Christ is coming back. Amen? Amen. He is coming back. And we can have spirited debates about all the details and the arrangements and all of that. Here's what we do know. He is coming back. And when Christ appears and returns, you also will appear with him in glory. So here's what that means. The way things look right now is not how they will look forever. This is true globally. This is true nationally. This is true locally. This is true personally. The way things look right now is not how they will look forever. And that should be incredibly encouraging to you. Because if we're honest, when you look at yourself, when we look at ourselves, what we see is what? Weakness, regret, we see sin, we see imperfection. That that is because we are always a work in progress. If you are in Christ, you have died with him, you are raised with him, 
and you are a work in progress. But hear this, that work, unlike the road construction in Tacoma, will not go on forever. (laughs) Not only will it not go on forever, but it is not in vain. Your life is not like the dishes that you load into the dishwasher over and over and over again, only to get them dirty and then put them back in. That's not you. We are not like the floors that we mop or vacuum only to get them dirty and covered with dog hair yet once again. Curse you dogs. We are not like our cars that you wash. And the next day, if you live in Washington, it is going to rain. Your cars that we clean and then there's pollen on them. The the, the cars that are accumulating Dust, the, the cars that, that the road grime and the, and the water, right? And, they just, and then you have to do it all over again. You're not like that. That's not what we're like. We are headed for glory. You are headed for glory. There will come a day, friends, when the work that God has started in you will be completed. And the only appropriate word for that is Glory. Glory, Romans 8, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Here's Paul's logic. In eternity past, God set his unique affection upon a people. He predestined a people to be saved and to be made his own. Those whom God has predestined, he calls. Predestination is what God does in the past. Calling is what God does in the present. When God awakens somebody to the truth of the gospel through the preaching of the gospel, that is God calling that person. And all that God, all who have been predestined by God are called by God. And all of those who God calls to himself, he justifies. He imputes the righteousness of Christ to them and declares them to be right based solely on the life, death, and resurrection of his son. And everybody whom God predestines, he calls, and all that he calls, he justifies, and all that he justifies, Paul says, he glorifies. That does not mean that God worships us. When we say we glorify God, we are worshiping him. It does not mean that God worships us. It means that in and through Jesus, God restores us to the glory of what he always intended humanity to be. C.S. Lewis has this quote that'll make you feel a little uncomfortable, but that's good. He says, remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. What he's talking about is that there's no ordinary people. That ordinary person who is imperfect and annoying When God glorifies them, their beauty will be so compelling that if you could see it right now, you would be tempted to bow down. When we look at ourselves, what we see is a human being that is very slowly being transformed by the power of God. Very slowly. We might say annoyingly slow. What we see is our flaws, our imperfections. We see our own weakness and we see our failures. And that is why when we look at ourselves, we are prone to be frustrated and discouraged. But know this, one day at the final resurrection when Jesus returns, that project, that transformation, God's work of sanctification in you that is making you more holy, that work will be totally completed. God will finish what he has started in you. Which means today, 
In Christ, we are free from the penalty of sin. There is no penalty that we are afraid of. It means that today, in Christ, we are being freed from the power of sin in our lives. We are being transformed. But one day in the future, we will be totally free from the presence of sin. Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 3, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Friends, we are no longer who we used to be. If you are in Christ, you are not who you once were. Your old self has been crucified and it died with Christ. And you have been raised with him in resurrection. So we are no longer who we used to be. But today, we are not what we will be. We are on the way there. And so from now on, until glory, we do what Paul says. Think about the things that are above, where Christ is seated. Remember who he is, what he has done, and who you are in him. Let's pray. Lord, our lives are evidence of your saving and transforming power. Indeed, it is your grace that we are no longer who we used to be because you have rescued us. You have put the old self to death and you have raised us to new life. And yet you are not done with us and we are not yet who we will be. Lord, we ask that you continue your good work in us. That you would change our hearts, our minds, our desires, the patterns of our life. That you would help us to remain focused on you, on all that you are, on all that you have done, and all the benefits of being united with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.